Hello, this is Dr. Helen Weatherly. Welcome to our Gender GP podcast, where we will be discussing some of the issues affecting the trans and non-binary community in the world today, together with my co-host, Marianne Oakes, a trans woman herself and our head of therapies. We have the lovely, lovely um, and, and inspirational Marlo Mack with us today. And I'm just going to tell you how I first came across Marlo before I um, introduce her. So I was in a conference in, um, at the W Path in Amsterdam 2016, and I was listening to somebody talk um, about looking after transgender children um, in healthcare. And it was the first talk that I'd been to which seemed to absolutely understand what I was feeling about um, transgender children and what they needed. And halfway through, um, the presenter played a video, um, and it was a cartoon video of a, a little cartoon girl teaching us how to be a girl. And I was absolutely spellbound by it. What are your favorite things to play with? My princess things. Your princess things? Why do you like princesses so much? I just kind of do. Do you think it's okay for boys to like princesses? Ah, uh, but I'm a girl. And that was my first introduction. And I remember going out and t- saying, anybody I could find, I have just seen this most amazing video, which just tells you all about it. Um, fast forward to 2020, and I'm now delighted to welcome Marlo Mack and her inspirational videos and podcasts and now audiobook um, to our podcast. So Marlo, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really, really excited to have you here. Tell us all about you and how you, how you started your lovely campaigning work. Oh, well, thank you, first off. So thank you so much for having me. This is a real honor and pleasure for me. I'm a big fan of what you're doing. Um, And I really enjoy listening to your podcast as well. Um, I'm just a... I'm just a regular mom, I guess. Um, A regular American mom um, who ended up with... Uh, an unusual situation and I happen to be have access to a recorder and when my daughter was very young when I still thought I had a son began recording her Um, and then she began saying these very interesting and at the time very surprising and and unsettling things Uh, I'm not a boy mama I'm a girl and uh, I, I was recording this all the, all along. I, I happened to be also working in a uh, for a radio show at the time. I was learning how to work in work in radio. So I I uh, took all those pieces and put them together to to tell our story. Um, I think I think hearing her little voice has an impact in a way that that all of us adults talking doesn't. And um, she did end up transitioning at age four, which people, I'm sure you've encountered many children like that, but people find that shockingly young, um, unless you ask them about their cisgender children. And they say, of course, my four-year-old boy knows he's a boy. <laughs> um, yeah. What child in kindergarten or even preschool doesn't know their gender? But um, so I now am uh, fast track to now. I am now the proud mother of a almost 13 year old daughter wow. and she uh, has not for one moment in all those years um for a millisecond even uh said anything other than i'm i'm a girl um as as you would expect from your average girl right <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, i always sort of i've come to kind of i kind of bristle a bit actually when people say well are you sure and mm-hmm. and um i i try and gently and kind of um, uh, with a little little twinkle in my eyes, say, "Well, are you sure that your daughter is is a girl? Uh, are you mm-hmm. sure that uh, that your thirteen year old doesn't want to grow a beard <laughs> um, when she goes through puberty? My daughter doesn't either. So um, that's sort of our story in a in a in, in a nutshell. Lovely. And um, uh, and Marla, I'm just going to challenge you on a couple of things that you said early on there. So you were talking mm. about when when your daughter was saying um, some surprising things and some unsettling mm. things, and then you talked yeah. about it being being shockingly young. I mean, why why is it that we have to use that that kind of language um, in this in this day and age? Why why is it is mm. that language still attached to this experience? 
Right. Well, I hope you know I'm putting shockingly in quotes. Um, of course, of because course. that's certainly. Um, but at the time, it, it was shocking, mm-hmm. and and that's what I, I try to stress over and over again um, in my podcast and um, and in my book that I that I just released um, is is how much I did push back, um, how much I did, um, you know, people I think. I think there's a stereotype or a belief that parents like me jumped right in with both feet or that we directed or led this, um, this whole gender um, project for our children that somehow this is what we wanted. Um, I've never encountered a parent like that, um, especially when I was going through this almost 10 years ago. Um, I had no reference points for this. And so it was really shocking. I, I had never heard of a child saying what my child was saying, which was, you know, mommy, I don't want to be this person. I'm not this person. Uh, she's even said, um, I want to go back in your tummy, put me back so I can come out again as a girl. Something went wrong in there. Do you remember what, what you felt like when people called you boy? I I felt sad when people called me a boy name and didn't understand. I felt sad and I didn't feel like who I was. How does it feel to feel, to be a girl? Like afterward, how did that go? Well, now I feel happy that they understand. So if someone asked you, what does that mean to be transgender for you? What do you say? What would you say? Well, I guess I would say that if you were born and your mom and dad thought you were a boy, but in your heart and when you grew up and you, f- and you could talk and tell them and you wanted to be a girl, like let's say you, they thought you were a boy because you had a penis, but you felt like a girl. And so, um, let's, for example, a girl with a penis would be transgender person. Or a boy with a vagina. What's your favorite thing about being transgender? My favorite thing about being transgender is that I'm myself now. When you're transgender, you're more yourself. Do you have any advice for kids who are transgender? Like, well, if if somebody keeps saying, saying, "No, you're a girl," or "No, you're a boy." Don't give up. Just keep on convincing them. And get a grown-up if they tease you and all that kind of stuff. You don't give up on being transgender. And I've heard that, now heard versions, dozens of versions of this story, often from children, about children. I'm sure you've heard these. Um, Mm -hmm. And it stops you in your tracks. Uh children who are five years old saying, can I, you know, how high is the roof? Can I jump off and come and go to heaven and come back as a girl or, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to jump out of the backseat of a car on the highway. Mm -hmm. Um, I know I've heard too many of these stories from parents and I think my own, my own daughter's experience was the same of um, really not wanting to be alive anymore uh, because this felt so wrong at such a young age. And um, to your question about the shocking, um, you know, I think we just, most people still are not not exposed to this and assume that it's somehow a, a, a modern fad, a, something born, you know, a couple, last decade in San Francisco. Um, I live in a very liberal city in Seattle. Um, so there are a lot of assumptions made that somehow this was, you know, a cool, a cool trend that we were hopping onto. Um, but um, you know, it's um, it's unnerving when you um, yeah. encounter something, something new, and um, I think people do get very scared. They worry about children, and that's fair. But um, if they if they get to know us, if they come to our homes, if they meet, meet our children, um, as you know, from working with these kids, yeah. um, there's nothing more real and sort of innate about what they're telling us. Yeah. Can, can I just interject? Of course, of course. Well, please. A, a couple of things. I think you're, you're right. And one of the things I think you've done brilliantly 
is you've been able to make this real, I think, through your podcast. That too many times we talk about trans children like they're a separate entity away from the rest of society when really we, you know, they just are there and, and then amongst us getting on with their lives when they're allowed to. So that's, that was the first thing I wanted to say. The, the second one yeah. was you made a really good point there that struck me, you know, 10 years ago in Seattle, you know, which is a liberal city, but there was no Marlowe Mack. There was very little spoke about 10 years ago in relation to children being transgender. And I just wondered where you found your your help. Your, where did you learn? Who, who had gone before you? Oh, that's a great question. And yeah, 10 years ago, it is, it's a lifetime ago on this issue. Um, we didn't have Caitlyn Jenner in the, in the world that we knew of. We didn't have Laverne Cox, um, so many people, Elliot Page. And um, all we had and all I had in my mind were the most just horrendous stereotypes um, from really salacious talk shows here in the U.S. We have this thing, this show called Jerry Springer, which is just notorious for really, really, um, you know, horrible sort of train wrecked lives um, and people shouting at each other and it's, you know, shock television. And that was the only time you would see transgender people. Um, and, you know, it was impossible to see that. Um, or also, you know, in, in films, um, people who were criminals, um, usually sex workers. Um, uh, you know, that's, that was the only image uh, that I had of, of a transgender person. And um, so as a mother, you think, well, how could that have anything to do with my beautiful little child? Um, so I had to dig. I had to dig for information. Um, I mean, I, I asked my mother, and she'd never heard of this. You know, she says, I asked, you know, my great, my grandmother who had nine great grandchildren was absolutely perplexed. Um, all the aunties, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't, it just wasn't spoken about in my family or in the culture at large. Um, I eventually, I mean, I was, was so lucky, our timing really, I, I pinch myself when I think about our timing. Because had my child been born, I think even five years earlier, I think we would have had a vastly different experience. Um, there really was almost nothing then. The, uh, the support group that I eventually found, which uh, was in, in my hometown of Seattle, and was one of the few uh, earliest and, and uh, groups of its kind anywhere, I think, uh, certainly in this country, um, it, I believe, had its first meeting the month my child was born which I thought was really beautiful symmetry, kind of poetic. And by the time we found it um, a few years later, you know, it was still this tiny little crew of parents sitting around a conference table, maybe five parents, sometimes as many as 10. Um, and a, a major metropolitan area like Seattle, um, and you're talking parents of kids from, you know, of any age who are, who are gender nonconforming. And this is all they've been able to bring together at that point. Now it has, because of there's been so much more awareness and, um, and support, now it's grown. And, you know, it's, it, I think the same group has split off into many, many groups because there's uh, so many people realizing this is happening with their children and, and they're seeking the support. Uh, but I was able to find a couple of moms who had gone before me who were just a few years ahead. And um, I particularly uh, bonded with this dear woman who's still my dear friend, whose daughter is uh, now 20. Uh, but at the time she was sort of our, our go-to for what, what was coming several years down the road. Um, and so we watched her go through her, you know, getting her blocker and, um, and starting high school as a young woman and 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 so they i did have a few people um that i managed to find who were sort of blazing the trail for me we were certainly not the first to go down this path um, but i think i was one of the first to to sort of start saying well let's let's put a story out there because i could not find any stories like mine um i first before i started the podcast i started writing a blog and um 
I thought, well, some, surely somebody's written this down and put it on the internet. Everything's on the internet. Uh, but no one apparently had that I could find. So I, I one day just sort of sat down in a, in a pub after work with my, with my beer and <laughs> typed it out and made a blog. And, and that was the, sort of the beginning of sharing, sharing our story. It's lo so lovely to hear you talk um, uh, yeah, in, in that soothing voice I've heard so often on your, pod on your podcast. Um, but yeah, so going back to, you, you, uh, you didn't know what was happening. Your daughter from a very, very early age was, was saying that something was wrong. I feel sad about that, actually, because it's not wrong, is it? It's not wrong. I, I, again, I, I, hate, I hate the language that's sometimes associated with this. But anyway, that's how, how yes, your daughter no, expressed it. I absolutely agree. And I, I hope it's now I'm not giving the impression that... Um, not at all. That it's I just think so. that, yeah. She no. felt wrong. And yeah. certainly because her mother wasn't seeing who she really was. I, I truly yeah. believe that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and you, you, you said, uh, you know, that when you were explaining it, you were, you were saying that Marianne and I will have will have come across stories like this, and of course we have, mm. you know that. And often we hear the guilt of the mum who, at the beginning, when you you were explaining that you did push back and you didn't jump in too quickly, you know, as if you would, as if you would somehow be um, accused of of wrongdoing if you hadn't pushed back and you had jumped in too quickly jumped into quickly what to accept your daughter you know but anyway we right, do we, right, we hear right. those stories we hear those stories time and time again so I was just wondering for you like if if you if you had kept on pushing back and hadn't allowed your daughter to transition at, at that shockingly young age of four what, what do you think would have happened what, what would have would your life have been different yeah, and you know, you I, I suppose at the time and even now I, I do feel sort of defensive because the world mm -hmm. is is sort of arrayed against us saying, you know, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you mm -hmm. sure? How could you know? How can you know? How can she know? Um, and so you do kind of get into this defensive mode and you're probably hearing that from me mm -hmm. now, um, even though I'm, I'm, I know I'm speaking to a friendly <laughs> audience who's very well informed. Um, but um, yes, you do sort of have to make your case, I think, mm -hmm. as a, and you get used to making it um, because there is such a misperception that this is somehow my agenda, I think, um, mm -hmm. and not my child's. I mean, it really was the saddest, saddest thing, our, our house before she transitioned. I mean, you know, she still had her beautiful little spark. She's just such a, just such a enthusiastic you know uh, mm. person who just loves life and is is and I think it comes through in the podcast she's she's very um she's just a fun happy person by nature mm. but that was fading and um all my sort of machinations you know you can be any kind of boy you need to be I thought that surely that will work surely mm -hmm. Surely it's just that we're not allowing her a space to be a boy, um, this different kind of boy. But I, you know, so I, and that's a, such a, such a major thing that's leveled against uh, this situation is that, oh, well, it's, you know, you, you're homophobic. You don't want, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're uncomfortable with having a son who's not conforming or who's potentially gay. Um, and so I, I do um, think it's really important to make that point that, um, you know, most parents are, are going to be more comfortable, I think, having a, a son who's, it, it's, a, it's an easier life, right? Um, it's probably going to be an easier life for your child to be, to, to live in the gender that was assigned them at birth. So most parents, um, you know, we would joke in, in the support group if, oh, I just wish my son were gay, you know? Mm -hmm. um, now, I, now I actually kind of bristle at that. You know, I've really come... Um, I um, I think it's it's disloyal and um, and transphobic, frankly, to say I wish my daughter weren't trans. I wish she mm. were a gay son. I I want her to be her, and I adore who she is. So I I wouldn't change a hair on her head. I wouldn't I wouldn't you know I want her life to be easier. I want the world to change, but I don't wish my daughter were not transgender because I wouldn't wish she weren't herself. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like I've strayed from your original question. <laughs> I apologize. Please feel free to redirect me back. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I love your story. Um, Mar- Marianne, what do, what do you think? Um, got, I'm sure you've got lots to say. It's so lovely, isn't it? Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is, uh, you, you said something earlier on that I think was really powerful, that if she'd have been born five years earlier, mm. it may have been a different story. And Helen asked the story that, that yes. I question what would have right. happened if you had pushed back. And I think right. the truth of the matter is, um, you know, you'd have just had one continual fight because you, your daughter is trans and nothing was ever going to change that. The only thing that would have changed was, would be her route to discover or to exploring it. Um, but then them five years definitely was crucial. I've, I've seen it over the years, yes. how quickly it's changed. Right. Uh, so yeah, t- 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 I'll bring you back to that question. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I did kind of lose my way there. I apologize. <laughs> I get very passionate when I talk about yeah. my daughter. Um, straight to my heart. Um, uh, yes, I think I saw what was going. I saw where it was headed. Um, I I I realized that there was no. I, I had somebody very wise tell me, you know, if she's transgender, there's nothing you can do to make her not. Mm-hmm. And if she isn't transgender, nothing you can do will make her transgender. And I think that is, of course, the other sort of huge thing people mm-hmm. claim or fear, parents fear. I have parents a lot email me and say, well, well what if I say this word transgender and then they are become it, you know, as if, you know, as if this, you could, force someone by just suggesting that something exists, that they're suddenly going to jump into some identity that doesn't fit them and is frankly, you know, a much harder life. I, I finally accepted that this, it, it was a relief actually. It was, well, she is, who, this child is who this child is and I'm in, I'm in for whatever that is. And that was the best decision I ever made. And it was terrifying. Um, but I let go and I, I just said, you know, are you still a girl? I, there was a moment I actually sat her down on the couch and said, "Are you? Do you still want to be a girl?" And she said, "No, Mama. I, I, no." And I, I would say, "What? No?" <laughs> and she said, "I, I still am a girl." Mm. And and that I think is one of the most profound statements that, the the truest thing I've ever heard. You know, it was mm. oh, okay. Um, whatever this gender thing is, it it just emanates from something deep and, and, and inherent inside of her. Now, do fairies and princesses wear particular colors? Fairies wear purple and princesses wear pink. There, there is some pink fairies and purple princesses, but they live all the way in a very far away land. We cannot see them. Too far away? Yeah. If I had not gone down that path with her, the thing is, I felt like, I, I really felt like I didn't have a choice at that point. It was starting to feel like abuse, yeah. you know, just questioning her so much. And I, I watched her little face fall. I, I would avoid pronouns altogether. I would just avoid her birth name because it, it hurt her so badly. I would call her my precious, my sweetheart. Um, and, um, but it just was, it was getting way too tortured. And then when I, when I let go and I embraced her, the light shone again and we were happy and it was easy. It was easy then. Mm. Everything that had been hard and painful was gone. Mm. Um, of course, and then we had just normal problems like every mother and child. But um, yes, I think that um, I, I could not have imagined pushing back harder than I did without literally dis- just destroying her spirit. And um, I... I hear from young people all the time uh, writing me saying, how do I convince my mom? How do I convince my parents? I hear from a lot of kids in the UK, actually. Yeah. Um, and they just say, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And I just say, please, you know, please don't give up hope, really. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I don't know how my child could have had a life really worth, worth living um, if we hadn't, hadn't gone down this path. Yeah. Mm. 
And there are two things for, for me that, uh, that come from, if we don't accept trans children and allow them to be who they are, you've got the first one, which is the, the real pain that you were just describing in, in your own family relationship when your daughter wasn't being accepted for who she was and, and the joy that came out of you accepting her. And then I think about those those children who are emailing you saying, how can I get my mum to understand this? Because it's not like that's the only thing that's bad thing that's going to happen because then puberty is coming. And, and I think, from, you know, that's the second thing for me is not only not being accepted by your parents um, and for who you are, but then knowing that something is coming and you never know when it's going to come. You don't know if it's going to be nine or 10 or 12 or 15, but you know it's yeah. coming. And with that is going to come some travesty. And I think that it must just be so... Oh, I don't know, so scary for these young people. But your, your daughter got yeah. their blocker, her blocker recently. Um, I wonder yeah. how, how, how easy or hard was that? Obviously, we've just had a little bit of a hiccup, yeah. if I can call it that, in the United Kingdom. Right. Where we've taken a very yeah. back, back step. Um, but uh, well, how was it in, in, in your country for, for your daughter getting her blocker? Well, I mean, I have to say we've been incredibly lucky. Um, as you, I'm sure you know, the medical system in the United States is, a, is kind of a disaster. Um, the, you know, where the, the privilege to get wonderful care and um, many people are left with uh, no care. It's, it's a travesty, really, for such a wealthy country. Um, but I happen to be, um, have a good job and good health insurance. And so my daughter and live in a, in a, it also varies hugely by state. So some states like the one I'm in um, require that insurance companies cover transgender care. Mm -hmm. um, and um, our provider, uh, my, my, my child's doctor was incredibly supportive. Um, so we had, um, you know, it was just a breeze, frankly. Um, we went in to see her doctor about a year ago. Um, and said, you know, we think this is probably coming. You know, she's she was 12. She's a little bit of a, a late bloomer, I think, on the puberty side. Um, so we, we knew that it probably wasn't immediate, but we wanted to kind of lay the groundwork. Um, there was no question when we went into the doctor's office. You know, she, she uh, in her first meeting with my daughter, um, she encounters this, you know, little uh long you know long blonde hair um little sprite of a girl and um who was i guess 11 or 12 at the time and um you know we say well she's this is you know she transitioned at four and here we are and and she just said okay um and they they did have a few um a few sort of gatekeeping steps there was a a very a rather uninformed <laughs> psychologist <laughs> we had a very awkward couple of interviews with and some very silly paperwork to fill out um asking questions that were you know sort of really not a per not really relevant yeah. to a, a child of my daughter's age because a lot of them were geared at old, to older children you know um but you know, so there was some there was some kind of silly things in the system. I understand though that they that they need to kind of have these, um, I guess, checks. I, I, you know, I don't quite know. I I know it needs improvement, but for mm -hmm. us it was easy. Um, it certainly felt like just checking a box um, mm -hmm. rather than an interrogation. I think that's what's important here is that mm -hmm. the assumption wasn't that we didn't have to prove anything. Well, it's called a blocker for a reason. It blocks my puberty. What puberty does it stop? Um, the wrong puberty. If you didn't do that, then what would happen if you didn't get the blocker? Well, my voice would change. It would be lower. And I would get more hair. I would start getting facial hair. And those things are... Not what I want. Yeah. Do you feel like it's kind of like you're entering like a rite of passage almost? Sort of something. I'm getting my blocker. How are you feeling about that? I'm nervous but excited. I don't get why I can't skip school the day before. When you meet a child like mine, it's it's very clear. Um, and um, so we we had a very easy time. Our biggest challenge was actually that COVID hit uh, right when puberty did. Um, mm -hmm. So she went into, uh, her blood test showed that she was in 10 or 2, and um, because of the lockdown, they were not doing any non-essential procedures. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I said, wait, wait, this is essential. <laughs> this is a life-saving medical Sorry. intervention that she not go down the wrong puberty path. But they, um, fortunately, we were able to, to get her in um, last month and, and get that done. And she has an implant, um, which I, I think is a wonderful thing. So she doesn't have to have regular shots and, and, yeah. and really doesn't have to think about it for the next couple of years or so. Yeah. Marianne, what difference would that make to some of our UK young people? <laughs> it, it just blows me away. Um, mm. the, the, you, you, you got the access. And I know you said there were some gatekeeping things, but um, the trouble we have with young people in this country, that the process can actually be traumatising for them. And mm. I don't think how they look ah. then to the, the professionals mm. makes one jot of difference. And that sadly... Uh, has been proven to be the case time and time again. I do, um, you said something earlier, uh, which um, I kind of made a mental note of when you said that you asked your daughter, does she still want to be a girl? And she said, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I am a girl. And I think yeah. that's something that, and, and as the trans representative on the podcast here, that I think some cis people really struggle to get their heads around, that we are not dealing with a cisgendered person, that all the appropriate questioning and all the appropriate approaches to their care has got to come from a trans perspective, not a cisgendered perspective. But unfortunately, the medical profession, and it sounds a little bit the same where you are, although a, an easier uh Root to care, but they, they 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 haven't got that computed in their brain that I am dealing with a, a trans girl here. I am not yes. dealing with a boy. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I, you know, I I I don't I'm not sure that I, um, you know, and I hope I didn't sound like I was sort of approving of um, a, a bunch of gatekeeping at no, all. No, no, um, no, no, no. You know, I think um, you know, I. I I found the, the the process we went through very respectful, um, some of it a little silly, but um, I think I think you're absolutely right that you know I it's it's something as a as a parent I mean I, I'm not transgender so I I can't pretend to understand what that actually feels like, but I do love with my whole heart the person I love most in the world is and and. Um, so I do see uh, right up, I have a front row seat on, on her experience and um, how, how just ridiculous it is, um, the kinds of questions that, that people ask, the sort of assumptions they make um, that, that don't take into account um, her experience. Um, I, I, I think I... I, I get it in my gut, you know, that um, that people, they just don't understand that this is a fundamental part of her and um, just as anyone else, just as much as my gender is to me. Um, I think, I think what, what's so frustrating to me about uh, the gatekeeping around, well, particularly now it's coming up, especially in your country, mm -hmm. Uh, the blocker um, and unfortunately we're having a lot of that here um, state in various states um, state legislatures are coming forward with legislation um, to outlaw to to prohibit the use of this which is outrageous why why should lawmakers be telling doctors you know what they can prescribe to their patients um, so we have the same debate here um, and the thing I come back to again and again is, you know, is just the innate transphobia of of the arguments. You know, the the what they really are saying is that one cisgender child's experience, one cisgender youth's experience, outweighs the the incalculable suffering of a thousand children like mine. That we're willing to to deny. Uh, this life-saving medical intervention to to hundreds, perhaps thousands of children like mine, because God forbid we get we give blockers to one cisgender child or hormones, you know that that child's, you know, and of course we want to get it right, and of course, you know, there is no such thing as a hundred percent 
uh, you know, effectiveness rate, right, of any medication, of any inter intervention. But, you know, I know I had, I talked to Dr. Johanna Olson about this, actually, uh, who's going to be on my podcast. Um, and she said, in no other area of medicine would you, would you expect 100% success rate and if you couldn't get it deny the care to everyone mm -hmm. um and um anyway that's that's kind of that that's where i come back to again and again is that that it um it devalues my daughter's life you know inherent in these arguments is that a transgender life is worth uh less than a cisgender one I actually borrowed that from Julia Serrano. I can't, I can't take credit <laughs> for that argument. She wrote beautifully about the, about this in an essay. I, I, I the example that I use, and I mean, I'm a big fan of Joanna, Joanna's work, and the example I use is, is, of, is, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Why do we have to use such extreme examples to try and make this very simple? Point. But you know, yeah. I imagine, you know, young children who have to have a heart operation, um, and yeah. the, I know that the doctor has to tell that family that there is a chance that your child won't make it, um, and there might be even a ten or twenty percent chance that your child won't make it. Um, but if they don't have the operation, there is also a chance that your child might not make it. And that ch that child and family have got to make that hideously awful decision, um, and watch their child go under anaesthetic, and that and not and then walk away from the operating theatre, not knowing. Whether whether their child is going to be one of the ones that makes it or not. Um, and that's what we're talking. We're talking in a, that's an awful statistic, isn't it? So are we saying that not yeah. one single child should have a heart operation because 10 or 20 percent undergoing that horrible operation will not make it? And therefore, the other 80 or 90 percent of children who go through the operation won't, won't make it either because, you know, that operation is needed. Um, and it's so true, isn't it? You know, one, cis, one cisgender youth outweighs um, all those transgender um, children who are being denied the care that they need it just in case we get it wrong for one. Right. And actually... You know, if if we were getting it wrong for, for for those ones, where are they all? I mean, okay, we had we've had a couple in um yes in right. court we, just recently where we've had one who mm -hmm. who regrets the steps that they took um in 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 taking medicines which altered their appearance and they regret that. But that's one story. Where if if there were so many that that we were doing this wrong to, they would all be coming out going, I agree, I agree, I agree. But we don't hear those. What we're hearing is cisgender people saying, we must be careful. We must be careful not to hurt our cisgender um children just in case. You know, never mind all those transgender right. children that don't exist. You know, it's 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 shocking. It is. It is. Uh, just to put it into context, I think, um, I'm not sure what the, the actual figures are, but you could argue there's a 1% chance the doctor could get it wrong with a mm. trans child. Um, and if we actually had a better environment where there was less media coverage and more social acceptance, that 1% would reduce you know, um, probably to nearly 0.1%. So, you know, the, I think the climate that we've um, created isn't helping that 1%. Uh, but that, that's, that's what I believe it is. It still wouldn't be justified to, to restrict access to care. I just want to, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, and there was a question that I've been burning to ask you, uh, Marlo, if you don't mind. Yes. I know when I work with parents of uh, children that are, you know, prepubescent, um, the, the biggest anxiety they have is how do I prepare my child for the future? You know, how do I help them to overcome the idea that they may never carry a baby or huh. you know, uh, the, the, the surgeries that they're likely to have? And I'm just wondering whether you navigated that and what advice you might give that are facing mm -hmm. well that's a good question a big question i apologize yeah it is no no it's really good um my heart just kind of swelled at that you know um it's i mean there's multiple things there i think um the medical side the sort of potential for um medical interventions um shots or surgeries or whatever um 
you know, that um, for me, that um, for us, that emerged very, very naturally because she wanted to be reassured at age four and five that she wouldn't end up looking like her dad when she grew up. That was terrifying for her. You know, oh gosh, mom, I can't grow a beard. Please tell me I won't grow a beard. And so when she was very young, um, the way I put it was, well, you know, when you're older, um, the doctor can give you some medicine to make sure that you look the way you want to look. And that if you want to look more like mom and not and not daddy, then the doctor can help you with that. And so just very, very just simple language. There's medicine to help you, sweetheart. Um, and, I, and that was enough. Um, for my child in terms of sort of dysphoria around her genitals, um, that's been fairly minimal because we've, um, I think because uh, she... Um, I, I've always tried to say, I, I actually really don't like the phrase born in the wrong body. I don't think there's anything wrong with her body. Um, and it implies that that everyone should should have the same kind of transgender body or cisgender body. Um, and so I've always tried to say, you know, you if you want to change um, that part of your body when you're older, you can, but you can also stay how you are. You know, because surgery is very frightening, I think, for children to imagine. It's It's very... Uh, I think it's very scary. And so, um, especially for my daughter, who doesn't like any kind of shots or medical things. So um, I try and keep it very gentle and just say, you know, you're beautiful. Um, if you, we, we'll make sure you get what you need. And there is good, there are, there's doctors and there's medicines to help you when you're older. And that really did the trick for her. Um, around the... Um, around the fertility thing, you know, that's, uh, that, that's a tough one for me. Um, and I, I think I've seen this with, I have a, now a lot of friends who are mothers of transgender daughters. And um, in some cases, these, you know, you have these little girls who are five years old, six years old, and they're just heartbroken when they realize that it's very unlikely that they'll ever be able to carry their own child. Um, and you think, wow, this, this runs deep, huh? I mean, they want, they dream of being mothers at that age. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, if that doesn't speak volumes about who they are, I don't know what mm -hmm. does. My daughter's always been a little prickly with the little kids. <laughs> so mm -hmm. she thinks babies are really disgusting. And um, so um, there's less of a, of, I think, a heartache for her at this point. But um, but that could change, right? I mean, most humans, mm -hmm. most of us do want to, most of us do end up having children. Um, and so I, 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 I know that, that may be a very painful thing for her at some point um, because, I mean, there are really amazing experiments going on now to provide her with a, a path to biological parenthood. But it's, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, a way down the road and probably a lot less likely than other options for parenthood for her. Um, so we've been talking since she was very little about adoption. And we have a lot of friends. In fact, our dear friend who's... Um, the older trans girl who kind of models yeah. things for my daughter is herself adopted and um and is every much as as you know as every bit a, a real daughter to her mm -hmm. to her mother so um you know i i do try um and i hear from a lot of adoptive parents on this issue who get they bristle just the way i bristle when people say mm -hmm. you know my my transgender daughter is somehow less of a you know a wonder they say you know this adopted child is is just as every bit as my you know my daughter um but of course it's 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 very painful anytime you have to uh tell your small child that they may be may not be able to experience one of the things that all their peers Ex, you know, mm. expect to have as part of, of their human experience. Um, and um, as a mother, as someone who dreams of being a grandmother, that's, that's a tough one for me. And I, and I, I know that I, I need to get over myself and, and, uh, and go, how lucky am I that I may have a beautiful adopted grandchild someday, you know? Um, but um, that's when I still, I still grapple with, were there any parts of that question that I, but he didn't um, get out. Well, you, you, you can't see us, Nana, but we're both spellbound. <laughs> I assure you, listening to your beautiful um, 
uh, answers. I feel like I'm sitting there in in the room with your, you and your daughter. It's lovely. Um, I, I, well, the other thing you can't see, Marlo, but I can see is Marianne's Christmas tree behind her. And what I'm, I'm, it's it's near Christmas here. Um, as it, when I say that, it, it's going to, it's Christmas for everybody. But for someone who's listening to this in the future, it might not be near Christmas. But yes. some of the stories I've heard from families ha have been the most warming when, for the first time ever, the child had a boy Christmas present rather than a girl Christmas present, or the Christmas card was in the right name or the family member, grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle came over and used the right pronoun. I just wonder whether we could have, because we've, we've talked and it's been a little harrowing talking about some of the challenges. And I wonder whether we could really introduce some, some spirit here and, and hope and thinking about the real positive ways that families can, uh, can at Christmas time or at any other time, really, really make a difference to a young person and their family who, who might be struggling a little bit. Yes. Well, I mean, I would say um, our lives are, you know, nine, you know, we, we don't, we don't, sit around and talk about gender <laughs> we don't sit around <laughs> and talk about transgender that's not a word that comes up much um any more than we sit around and talk about what color her eyes are or which hand she's writing with you know it's just this is part of her this is part of our life and and our lives are, are joyful and um lucky and um and my daughter and i are so close. Um, I, I feel so lucky um, that she still likes me as a teenager, <laughs> as a 13 year old. Um, I think our, our the future for children like mine is just full of hope. And um, I think that these these young transgender people are are already changing the world and will continue to do so. And they and they are such an example of, of, of something that I think we should all aspire to, which is, is listening to our own hearts about, you know, who, 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 I, who am I and, and what do I need to be in the world? And asking to be seen and loved uh, for that. And when that happens, I, I see it over and over again. I have now so many friends with, with transgender children and they're thriving. I mean, they are just... They're like my daughter, you know, this is, this is one important piece of who they are, but it's not, as my daughter put it one time in a recent episode of the podcast, which I loved, she said, you know, transgender is it's an important part of me, but it's just one part of me. And, and first and foremost, she's a little girl, she's a teenager, she's a human. And um, I think if we, if, we, if we keep focused on that, um, you know, and, and don't get over over anxious about how is this going to turn out, you know, uh, certainly with parents who are just learning this, just getting this information from their children um, and are surprised and scared. You know, my, my number one piece of advice would be just take a deep breath and, and stay there and listen and, and be with them, walk with them and, and, um, and let them know that wherever that journey leads, that you'll be there. Um, and then I, I, I think all will be well. I, I really believe that. I, I just wanted to say that just listening to your talk, <clears throat> even with the question that I asked before, the one thing I've picked up, the one theme is that you've, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm assuming that you've given your daughter the environment to grow up and be confident in who she is. And, are offering her all the aspirations of any 13 year old girl, you know, that she's going to come with, you know, a problems that 13 year old girls have. And that's just how it should be. It doesn't need to be about, yeah. need to be about anything else other than just getting on with her life. And I would say to, you know, a, a family asked me, um, recently, I, I sat with them and right at the end, I said, have you got any more questions? And they said, we have actually what what kind of, it, it was a trans boy so you know what kind of a life can uh, can he expect and i said um i just said he can expect the life of any 17 year old boy <laughs> you know yes. if you don't believe that then they might not you've got to believe that they are your son they are 
going to get on with their life and they're going to fulfill their potential. And I think if you can instill that in your children, whatever, you know, it's a bit like if you did have a child with some kind of disability and if, if you limited their expectations because of that, then they'll only, they, they will not flourish, you know, they will not thrive. Yes, so I yes. Think too, that I was picking up the, that that's what you've been doing. I don't know whether you'd have phrased it that way, but that's what I've, I've kind of picked up on. Well, I would say that, you know, our problems are really normal problems, normal in quotes, of course, but, you know, all her problems are the problems all her friends are having. You know, she doesn't want to do her homework. <laughs> she, <laughs> uh, she, you know, wants more time playing with her online Minecraft, you know, with her friends and uh, doesn't want to go to bed. Want, you know, these, these are our problems and I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. It's, um, it can be and absolutely should be um, just a, a regular life. Uh, that's what we aim for. Yeah. But now let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go. Let it go. Turn away and slam the door. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed our program today. Please go ahead and subscribe to future episodes if you haven't done so already. If you or anyone else have been affected by any of the things that we've talked about in our podcast today and you'd like to contact us, please visit our website, Help Centre, and contact us via there. We are very happy to accept ideas for future episodes and future guests, so let us know if there's anything specific you'd like us to cover. You can also visit our website, gendergp.com, for a multitude of information about transgender health and well-being issues. You can follow us on social media. ID is at gendergp, and you can sign up to our monthly newsletter. Full details can be found in our show notes on our podcast page. Thanks for listening, and see you soon.